a solar polar vortex, some fast solar wind, and some old big flare players return for another show. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com dot edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Our star puts on an amazing show this week as we take a look at our Earth-facing disk. Back on the second, if you look in the north, there's this prominence that's rising off of the surface and watch it, a piece of it breaks off and whoosh, it becomes like this big vortex. We're calling it a polar vortex and we're seeing material wrapping all the way around the sun. And we'll talk more about the scientific implications for that in a minute. But meanwhile, back to the weather, we actually have a coronal hole that's been rotating in through the Earth strike zone and along with a, a big solar storm that launched kind of to the west of Earth, but kind of grazed us. It's been giving us, us a bit of activity. We've bumped to active conditions and have seen some aurora come down just barely into mid-latitudes, and hopefully we'll continue to have a little bit more activity over the next couple days before things completely settle down. So aurora photographers, you get a little bit more time for your shows. But that's not the only story. Over the past few days, we've actually had a lot of active regions emerging like little submarines to the surface of the sun, and some of them have become big flare players, like region 3213 that's fired off quite a few big flares over the past couple days. And then on top of that, we've also had other active regions that have survived their far side passage and now are rotating back into Earth view. In fact, one of them is old region 3190, and it is now renamed 30. 217, and on the 7th, wham, look at that. It fires off a huge solar storm and a very large M-class flare. This is really kind of the herald in a lot of the M-class flares that we've seen. And over the last three days, we have managed to see about 12 M-class flares. And we, right now, we actually have a couple of these regions have become X-class flare players. So we are expecting a lot of radio noise on the bands right now. We've seen region 3217, which seems to be leading the fray, shooting a lot of solar storms as well. So aurora photographers, hey, keep your fingers crossed. We might get a solar storm and some more aurora directed at it at us. In fact, on the 10th, when you look at region 3213, whoosh, right there, it's launched a, uh, a solar storm. It looks like this one's going to go north of Earth, but we are kind of just grazing the Earth strike zone. So we shall see if this one uh, ends up launching anything that goes to the west and north of Earth or if it actually hits Earth. We're waiting for chronographs to give us more information on that. But expect more of this kind of activity. Expect that the solar flux is going to continue to ramp up and that the noise on the radio bands is going to stay high easily over this next week and possibly longer because we have a couple more active regions that have still yet to rotate into Earth view. Now returning to that solar polar vortex, back on the second, we saw something that we haven't yet seen with SDO AIA imagery. As we take a look at the sun in the north, you can see a prominence material rising just to the left of the North Pole. And if we zoom in on the northern hemisphere and we label the sun's latitude, as well as change the color scale so that the prominence material shows up a bit more clearly, you can see about midday on the second, some of that material begins to get break off of the main structure and start getting caught up in what looks to be a polar wind. And as you, that stuff begins to get swept up in it, you can see it takes about eight hours for that material to completely circumnavigate the pole at about 60 degrees. Now, preliminary calculations indicate that the, the speed of that wind ends up being about 96 kilometers a second, and that's an upper bound. Now, that's 60 miles a second, which is insanely fast. Now, this discovery has exciting implications when it comes to understanding the internal dynamics of our star, because our gas giants, both Jupiter and Saturn, also have similar types of polar winds. So it turns out our sun has more in common with these gas giants than one might think. 
Now at the sun, that magic region that transitions into that polar vortex happens at about 55 degrees latitude. And some of the internal dynamics happening in that magic region might actually explain how the sun's magnetic activity cycle is actually generated. So although the sun still holds on to some of its mysteries, today we might have gotten just one step closer. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, and by the 14th on Valentine's Day, the moon will still be about 41% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we have been dealing with the fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's been rotating in through the Earth's strike zone, and it has been giving us some decent active aurora, and some storming is expected to continue. So at high latitudes, we are expecting up to minor storm conditions, but we do have about a 40% chance of a major storm, and these kind of conditions could continue easily through the weekend before things begin to calm down. Now, as we switch to mid-latitude conditions, well, it's not quite as intense, but we are expecting expecting active conditions over the next day or so with things beginning to calm down and by Sunday things should be back to mostly calm. So we do have aurora possibilities right now even down into mid latitudes, but it just won't last quite as long. However, as we begin to move into the next week, Conditions are calm right now, but with all those solar storm producers beginning to rotate into the Earth's strike zone, these forecasts could change any minute. So aurora photographers, definitely make sure you keep vigilant because we could get some more aurora chances as we move into this coming week. Switching to your solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook, as you can see, nothing is in the green this week. We do have a lot of big flare players on the Earth-facing disk, and that does mean that our solar flux has popped back up over 200. This is good news for radio propagation on Earth's day side, except for the fact that we're dealing with so much noise on the bands this week. There is a lot of radio noise because we're getting a lot of radio blackouts from all of these big flare players. In fact, uh, NOAA is giving us about a 75% chance of M-class flares that's at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, easily over three days, and I've extended that over to the five-day mark because we just keep getting more regions that are big flare players on the Earth-facing disk. In fact, we have at least two uh, X flare players, which means an R3 level radio blackout is on the menu, and that could easily last over this week and possibly through next week before things finally begin to calm down. Switching to your radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are still in the green when it comes to radiation storms. We're in the D1 normal range, so we don't have any issues currently. However, if you take a look at the risk for radiation storms, it is beginning to ramp up. In fact, by the 13th, we could be at about a 15% chance of a radiation storm, and this is due to those big active regions, those big flare players rotating to the sun's west limb. So uh, pilots, definitely pay attention to those ICAO advisories. Not only are the space weather advisories being given out due to the big radio blackouts that does affect radio communications for you, but also because of the radiation storm risk, especially as we move into the uh, early part of next week. And these conditions could easily continue over the next week following that. So again, Make sure you take a look at those advisories often. So the space weather this week has gotten very exciting. Not only are we dealing with some fast solar wind that's been giving us some beautiful aurora shows uh, down into mid-latitudes over the past day or so, but we also just had a new solar storm that was launched that might be partly Earth-directed. It's a little bit early to tell. And then on top of that, we have some new active regions that will be rotating in through the Earth strike zone that are solar storm producers. So over this next week, we could have even more chances for solar storms. So aurora photographers, wow, you know, their chances of getting aurora at Earth is looking better and better each day. So definitely stay tuned because there's surely going to be more to come. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, things aren't looking all that great. Yay, solar flux is back up into the 200 range. But with 
12 radio blackouts in three days. <laughs> That's not making you feel too good, I'm sure. But don't worry, it's not your rig. Please don't be climbing up on your rig or rewiring all of your equipment because it's likely not your equipment. It's just the sun. So just hang in there. And if, if worst case comes, comes around, just communicate on the night side because radio blackouts don't affect you on the night side. And now for you GPS users, well, things aren't looking all that great for you either right now. With all these radio blackouts, it does make it a little bit difficult to get decent GPS reception near dawn and near dusk. And then, of course, with some of the solar storm activity, you don't want to get anywhere near Aurora if you're dealing with GPS either because it also, the reception is just not reliable. So just kind of hang out over this next week or two and, you know, just be very vigilant because you're going to be struggling with less than optimal GPS reception. And then pilots, of course, if you're flying a drone, please make sure that you calibrate your magnetometers often and be very vigilant. And then the rest of you, make sure that you're checking those ICAO space weather advisories often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.